Hello, everybody. We are live. I'm going to give everyone a few minutes to start rolling in. Make sure we get people in here to ask some questions. And then we will get started. All right, if you are in here already, feel free to drop your uh, project in the comments or tell us where you're coming from. Um, totally cool. Uh, just something to note, if you are on Backerkit's Facebook page or uh, on Backerkit's YouTube page, uh, then I can see the comments. Um, and if you're in our Facebook group dedicated to tabletop games, I can see your comments. Um, but uh, everywhere else, you'll have to go to one of those uh, for me to see. Um, otherwise, I'm using a new uh, platform called StreamYard, so I should have everything kind of funneled to me. So uh, when you do have questions or if you have questions now, feel free to just drop them in the comments of wherever you're watching them. And uh, I'm gonna just kind of take them in order that I get them. So uh, feel free to start doing that whenever you'd like. And it could be anything uh, crowdfunding related or it could be about your project specifically or something you're working on or have worked on or maybe a myth you want dispelled about crowdfunding. Really, anything goes. Um, just here to help and really the ultimate goal is to get you to put cool things out there into the world and you know make something and hopefully crowdfunding is the path for you a lot of opportunity there for everybody so while you're generating questions uh, i see as a few of you have already dropped some in thank you for doing that um while you're putting in some questions i'm just gonna introduce myself and backer kit so i am jason fury i have been with backer kit for about four years I've also ran a couple of crowdfunding projects uh, throughout the years, one for a comic book and another one for a tabletop board game. And that one's still being manufactured. Anybody dealing with manufacturing right now knows it's uh, very, very slow right now. A lot of the shipping containers and stuff, especially if you're uh, shipping overseas or in a country different from where you are, uh, it gets really challenging. So still managing that and still learning about that. Uh, I will drop some links. Uh, like I said, you'll only be able to see these if you're coming in through YouTube or Facebook. Um, otherwise, you can connect with me later and I can share some of these comments with you. Um, but yeah, moving on to Backerkit. What is Backerkit? If you don't know who we are, or what we do, basically we're a software company that helps crowdfunding creators manage their data, make more money, keep their backers happy. A lot of times we focus on the creator journey, the creator experience, and we want that to be really smooth, of course. But, you know, we don't want to forget about your backers journey because they're the ones that are making this all happen. So we want to make sure that their journey is really fun and feels like they're part of your community and all that jazz. So be sure to uh, really, really take time saying, will this make my backers happy? Will this be easy for my backers? I think Backer it really excels at creating software that helps uh, both creators and backers. And we have resources before, during, and after your campaign. A quick rundown is just before you launch, obviously we have resources, live streams, webinars like this, lots of blog content, lots of newsletter content, um, lots of how-tos, guides, stuff like that. And uh, we really, really want you to use those. Um, we also have something called Backer Kit Launch, which helps you as you collect emails and build your community, which is something that is really, really important with crowdfunding is collecting emails specifically for the project you're trying to sell. Um, it's really important for you to harness the power of that list and use it uh, the right way. So we have a, a tool called Backerkit Launch that can help you with that. And I will drop just our, our website in the comments here if you want to check us out. And uh, I'll put it on the banner as well. So backerkit.com, uh, you can learn more or ask me specific questions about how Backerkit can help you. Um, and then secondly, during your campaign, we do have a marketing service where we run ads for your project. Um, you have to qualify. It's not uh, available to everybody just yet, but you know, if you uh, qualify for it, we can help you during your campaign in that way. And also our resources can help you with that. And lastly, we have something called our pledge manager, which is software that we use. We kind of put in all these best practices from years and years of projects launching uh, into this thing that kind of helps you uh, reach out to your backer community and get all the information you need, make sure the, the what they want is coming to them and gives you an opportunity to raise some money and stuff like that. So we do have um, a pledge manager that will help you post campaign. Once you're successfully funded, a lot of people's biggest challenge is managing that success. So we wanna make sure you do that smooth to maintain your reputation and all that. 
Um, but yeah, you can ask me specific questions about those or, or, or check out our website. Uh, and then lastly, I'll share this again at the end of the Q&A. Uh, we have a few ways we would like to connect with you. And one of those is through our newsletter. This is probably the best way you can stay in touch with us and our content. Um, so I'm just going to throw in some links there. If you're not getting the links in your chat, um, you know, throw it up here. It's just backerkit.com backslash newsletter. And then you can sign up for whichever you want. We have a community newsletter, which is more for creators and getting uh, the resources that you need uh, directly into your inbox. And then we also have a few crowdfunding favorites newsletters. So we can kind of handpick a lot of the coolest stuff that's going on on Kickstarter, Indiegogo, uh, and we'll send that to you uh, multiple times a week to show you what cool projects are actually live right now. Um, secondly, we have a Facebook group. If you are, if you happen to be making a tabletop board game, uh, join this group. It is a place dedicated for folks that are running crowdfunding projects for tabletop games. So we have built a community. It's just kind of starting very intimate right now. It's a little over a thousand people, but if you have any questions throughout the week or anything about that, when it comes to uh, crowdfunding your tabletop game, join this group. Uh, I'm in there every day. So you can ask me live questions there outside of this as well. Um, and lastly, if for whatever reason, none of this stuff is coming through, or if you have specific questions, or if you just want to talk shop, uh, you can reach out to community at BackerKit. It's an email that I monitor, so I can uh, answer questions or we can connect in that way. And I also put in a form for uh, tell us about your upcoming project. The best way we can help you is to get an idea of what you're working on. So uh, please, please, please fill out that form. Uh, tell us about your upcoming project. And it's just really basic questions kind of about your audience size, the community you're trying to reach out to, how much work you've done before you hit launch, stuff like that. And then we can really sink in and try and set you up for success the best way possible. Um, but yeah, it looks like we've got a decent amount of questions coming through. So I'm just going to take these in order. Uh, I can pull up the questions on screen so you can see them. And then we will kind of go from there. First is not quite a question, but more a statement. I'm excited to launch my first campaign in a week. My goal is 100K. This is from Ulala Holly. Thanks for throwing that in there from YouTube. Um, I'm excited for your campaign. I don't know what it is. If you haven't linked it yet, throw it in the link or better yet, fill out that form so I can check it out in more detail. And uh, also make sure you do your due diligence uh, for that funding goal. 100K is a really high funding goal. Um, so. I think there's a lot of strategies around building your funding goal we can talk about if you have any questions about that. Um, basically, long story short, you're trying to make a goal that lets you, you know, it's worth your time. Maybe you don't make in a huge profit margin, but you're making that goal something that can get your product actually made physically in people's hands, cover all the stuff like taxes and shipping. Um, but yeah, we're working on a lot of resources that will hopefully help empower people to make the best decisions when creating their funding goal. Because remember, platforms like Kickstarter are all or nothing. If you don't reach your funding goal, if you made $900,000, but not 100, you don't get anything. Um, so is that the lowest number you could possibly get away with uh, to get this product made? Uh, that's something worth considering, um, but I'm excited. We do see projects that have goals like that and bigger and they work, um, but yeah, just make sure you do your due diligence there. Um, but excited. Here's another one, probably just more of a share. I'm from Australia. I've been working on my game, Scrap. Do I yell that? Scrap! For around 18 months. It's a bots on a map programming arena control hand management fun fest. That sounds like a fun fest. That's really cool. Thanks for sharing that. Um, we are presently raising 10K for made to order movies, an international studio without borders or walls. Very cool. This is great. Um, all right, here we go. We've got one from Mark Lewis Powell. Thanks for doing this. You're very welcome. Uh, I'm currently one week away from launching my game, Bounty Hunters. Should I ramp up the advertising spend this week or wait until launch? It's a very excellent question, Mark. Um, so when it comes to running ads for your project, there's a lot of ways we can approach this. Uh, the more that we've been looking into our customers, you know, we've serviced over 10,000 customers at BackerKit now, all crowdfunding creators, and we're just learning. We have a lot of insights on like what works and what doesn't. And something we're really interested in investigating right now is the difference between pre-live ads, which is like right now for you building up hype and generating uh, an audience, a community that's interested in your project, 
on the path to crowdfunding versus live campaign ads, which is Kickstarter's live, Indiegogo's live, whatever, and you want to drive people directly to the page. Um, I think it's fair to assume that you, the most value would come when you actually have something to sell and people like, oh, I'm just going to send them straight to the page where they can open up their wallet and give me money. But I would like to step back a little bit and kind of identify like loosely, this is going to be like a little broad, so apologies, but the value of the pre-live ad. I think if you're a first time creator, if you maybe don't have a huge audience yet, or if you just really want to build up hype and you have some marketing budget, I think it is an excellent idea to spend that marketing money on pre-live ads because there's a few reasons for that. One of them is, let's say you have a live campaign and you're running ads to your Kickstarter page. Let's say it's working, they're going there. You don't know if they're converting or not because you don't get that information uh, just through, through running the ad. You just know if they're going to your page or not. Um, you're not really getting any information from that person. You're not getting their email address, for example, which is very, very key. You're just kind of uh, sending them there and crossing your fingers and hoping they do it. Uh, and not to say it's not a great thing to do live ads. You should absolutely do ads while you're live. Uh, look into marketing services. Backerkit is uh, somebody that does it very well, in my opinion. But there's other you know, companies too. But uh, to kind of rein it back to the pre-live generation, if right now you know you're a week away, you want to build hype, you want to build interest, if the place that you're sending them to asks them to collect their email, or you can do it directly through, you know, through Facebook and stuff like that. To me, that's extremely valuable because you're not just getting one imprint or one quick bite. You're collecting them and actually putting them into your community. They can opt into your email, for example. Uh, and then you can message them multiple times as long as you want until they unsubscribe. So you're kind of, it's really valuable, in my opinion, to be building that email list and, and running pre-live ads is a really excellent way to do that. Um, so to answer your question, I think I'd have to learn more about your project. Feel free to fill out the form I linked above uh, and I can kind of like assess it and look at it a little bit more to give you like a more definitive answer. But I think if you have some marketing budget, maybe this is your first time, I would definitely consider uh, ramping it up uh, right now because then you can message them a, a few times. And we do have a service called Backerkit Launch that once you do have an email list built, like once you have a decent amount of emails, you can plug this in to Backerkit Launch and we can kind of tell you a percentage of how many of those folks have used crowdfunding before platforms like Kickstarter and Indiegogo. And we can kind of give it kind of a strength test if that makes sense. Like, is this list good? Because there's a lot of bad actors out there telling you they have great email lists and great newsletters, but they're not filled with the right people. A, they're not specifically built for you. They're, they're not all signing up for that email list for your product. They're signing up for it for who knows what reason. Like maybe it's just, I like crowdfunding, but that can mean anything. That can mean you like zines or just video games or just wearable headlamps or something. You know, there's all kinds of ways to do it. So you don't really want to be sending your messaging to people that just aren't interested. That's just, I don't know. That's just not, I don't know what the point of that is. Um, just kind of hoping that random people support your project. So. Yeah, I would keep, keep that in mind. Um, so I hope this like kind of answers your question, but if you're hesitating, I, I think if you have good images and you have the right strategy uh, and, you, and you have done a few experiments with advertising this week or, or the past few weeks and you're getting decent returns, I would say keep doing that up until you launch. I think that's a good habit to be in. Um, yeah, so this one's just fun. Hello, what's up? How's it going? Um, Here's one. Oh, I've seen this. We've just completed a full-length movie, Lead the Way, which highlights a new board game, uh, the Panzer game. I've seen this on Kickstarter. This is great. Thank you for sharing. First features on YouTube. Um, boom, boom, boom. Let's see. Jolly Swagman Games. Look at that image from YouTube there. So I've been doing a lot of advertising for my game to build up interest, mainly organic group participation marketing. That's a strategy, but I am curious as to what you would say best practice for marketing is. Okay, so marketing is a very loaded word. It could mean anything that has to do with, you know, building your community, showing people your pages and whatnot. Um, it's a common misconception that it's just running ads or something like that. That's just part of, that's a piece of the pie, right? So 
I'm glad that you're getting organic um, opportunities because that's, you know, that's, that's the dream world, right? Just participating in groups with board games. There's a lot of ways you can do that. Going to conventions, whether it's digital or physical, depending on where you live, um, running, uh, you know, blog posts, teaching people about your game and collecting emails, having a, a landing page. There's all kinds of things going, yeah, going to events and doing all kinds of stuff like that um, is a really good way to, to build it up. Um, but as far as a best practice for marketing, if we want to be kind of like generally speaking, the best practice is always, always, always use your product as the North Star. This seems very obvious and maybe simple, but a lot of people try and collect emails or get them from different outlets or different spaces. Just like, look at this, look at this, look at this. It should always, always, always really be about your theme, your product, and like who you're all about. And just find creative, unique ways to do that. Like I run a board game or I made a board game about like video rental culture, movie culture. So to me, my best practice is to reach out to people that I know are interested in tabletop games, but it's also kind of a, it's also kind of a intro to board games. It's kind of a light party-ish game. So I'm also wanting to appeal to people that are into movie culture. So I'll advertise it on a podcast about movies I do, or I'll write a movie review and then advertise it there and try and collect emails that way and just find what all of these peripheral things are in the orbit of your product that you could get away with. So I think people that would want my board game would like movies, would like to hang out with friends and are social and may or may not like board games. Maybe they're new to board games and they kind of want to see the potential of like what an indie game can be. So I kind of create like a, a, a cloud chart like you did in like school where it's like, these are all the types of people uh, kind of creating personas for like my, my project and trying to figure out who, who they would be. Um, but as far as advertising, uh, if you wanted to get a little, a little more nitty gritty about best practices, like really don't spam. Try try to be as passive as you can when it comes to getting people to sign up. If you have a solid landing page and you have it clearly stated on your website, like that you have a newsletter, maybe it's from a pop-up form or at the bottom of every page or in the sidebar, people aren't going to like miss it. They know it's there. They know that you have this newsletter. Um, so try not to like just spam people and, and have all your content kind of about like sign up for this, sign up for this, sign up for this. It'll be tempting because that's ultimately what you want to do, but you should be providing people value uh, and providing people insight into your process and into your product um, and then getting them to kind of be like, oh yeah, like this is cool stuff. This is cool content. Of course, I'm going to sign up for this. It's like their idea, you know, um, it's really tempting. So I think there's like a general um rule where it's like 80% of your content should be more about your theme and your project and what you're doing and pictures about the process. And then 20% uh, and, and, and sharing other people's stuff too. Like, don't make it all about you find people you admire and share their stuff too. And then the 20, the other 20% can be you asking for something, but if you're just always, always asking for something, it's going to create kind of a not great relationship uh, with your backers or potential backers. Um, just imagine if I just came to your house every day and was like, I'm hungry. Give me food. Like, where do I? I'm. Give me, give me, give me. Like, people would be like, "Let's not invite Jason back to your house, please." Uh, all he does is want to eat out of our refrigerator. Um, invite me in. Get me to watch a TV show. Get me to tour the house. Get me to pet the dog. And then, you know, by the way, we got a juice box in the fridge, and then I can come in and uh, drink the juice box. And then, then you got me. Uh, I'm gonna stick around. Um, it's a horrible analogy. I apologize immediately after saying that, but I think you get the point. Um, make it genuine, make it something that's gonna connect with your audience. And when it comes to email building, it's gonna be slow. Like people are gonna be, it, it, you might get one in a day and um, 50 the next day and zero some days, that's just fine. It's stacks and stacks and stacks. Trust me, if you just start implementing it and putting those best practices into play, you're gonna get you're going to get people, your list will build. Um, so just, you know, get through those days, just understand there'll be zero days and negative days. I I've had a few negative days this week with my email list. I'll send out an email and like four people unsubscribe, but nobody resubscribes. So I'm in the negative, but always maintain that positive energy about your product and stuff like that. Don't really highlight any of that, that stuff because, uh, people don't want to hear it. <laughs> um, but I hope that helps. Um, I'm looking forward to your game. Um, be sure to fill out that form or link it in the comments here so we can check it out. Um, let's see. Ba, ba, ba. There's another one. 
our old friend Mark's back. Also, I've had multiple comments in my feedback sessions that backers don't like early bird discounts. However, I seem to see them everywhere and they drive early sales to get the snowball rolling. What are your thoughts on early bird discounts? Another excellent question from Mark Lewis Powell. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you like early bird specials because uh, I think it, it just all depends on the person. I like them and I don't like them. The key is how you present them and what the ultimate goal is. To me, the perfect early bird special is something that's very clear way in advance. Like you're you're telling people, if you sign up for my newsletter and you back me within the first 48 hours, I'll give you a free enamel pin. Like if you do that early and often and make it super clear what's going on, that's great for your existing community. So they can like be rewarded for following you and being part of this journey and you can get them something special within the first 48 hours. Plus it won't exclude people that land on your page in those first 48 hours. And they'll probably, I don't wanna say impulse buy cause you never really, you don't really want that. Cause then it's like, that implies there might be regret later, but if they're on the fence that might push them over the fence is what I'm getting at. But um, that's that's like one way to, one way to look at it. Um, because I think a lot of the friction with early birds is that sense of fear of missing out. And I don't think fear should ever be attached to your project. I don't think people should ever feel sad or like, oh, I missed out. So I always recommend whatever you do offer, let's say you offer a free pin for 48 hours. I think it would be nice if at the end of the campaign, you would offer that item to people for a discounted rate. Like if it's a pin that would usually sell for 10 bucks, say I'll give it to you for five bucks. Um, and a really great way to do that is through the survey that you send once your campaign is over. And you can say, um, did, you know, you can do add-ons and extra items. So when you send a survey to somebody, you're collecting their shipping uh, money if you're charging shipping later and you're collecting their address, their shipping address. And you also through Backerkit have an opportunity to sell them more. Like, do you want an extra game? Do you want two games? Do you want this thing that's related to my game? Like, you know, whatever you have that's kind of complementary to your to your product, uh, and let people create a custom bundle experience and 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 add stuff to their cart. Um, if you do it in that way and you're clear about it, people will never technically miss out. They might miss out on it for free, but they can still get it for like really cheap later. So I think pins are a good example of something that works really well because the profit margins are so high on them. Uh, pins on average cost one to two dollars, depending on how complex they are, but they sell for like 10 bucks uh, typically. So you're making eight, eight to nine dollars per pin. So that's something you could afford to maybe give away for five bucks. And your profit would be a little bit smaller, but it's still profit. You're not losing money. Um, and if it hasn't been made clear yet, early birds should always, whatever it is that's the incentive, should always, always tie in directly with your core product, your base product. Never make it something weird or wacky like outside of it. It should be something that heightens the experience or is complementary to the experience that people will get from purchasing your base price. I do know in tabletop world, a lot of people do miniatures or unique dice sets that make the game different and unique, but it's not required. So it's kind of like a bonus. Like um, I think those things work really, really well. Um, so yeah, I hope I hope that answers your question um, because there's a lot of opportunity, uh, but it's all about your approach. Um, so just think about it, think about what your community wants. And if you have an email list and you're building it up and you have people, ask them what they want. You can you can have a few ideas. Like if you have like, oh, I could do a pin or I could do a miniature or I could do this, um, make a poll and say, hey, what do y'all want? Just shake people, like, what do you want? Like, I'll do what you wanna do because this is the community I'm building and I'm here to, to service this community. Um, you're still making your game, which is your passion project or your product, um, but, it, but it's okay for stuff like early birds to be a little bit more community driven um, and ask, ask them what they want. Uh, so I think that's cool. Appreciate that question, Mark. Oh, do, 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 do. here we go. We've got Leonardo. Can you describe exactly the user journey when using the pledge manager? Sure, this is a good question. So. Like I mentioned before, the pledge manager is a tool that we have that you use once you are successfully funded. So from a backer uh, journey point of view, you are on Kickstarter, which is a separate platform, obviously. So I'm back in the project, I'm excited, you get funded, you get charged from Kickstarter, uh, and then that, that transaction is complete. The, the backer and you have already made a transaction together, and then it's complete. 
you sync your Kickstarter project to Backerkit uh, and it populates into the, the back end, which will be how you create your pledge manager. Um, and then you, you can create a, a survey, like I mentioned before, which is what you're going to want to send to your backers uh, shortly, depending on your circumstances, maybe a little bit later, uh, to your backer community saying, um, what's your address? If you want to collect shipping, like some people collect shipping in the pledge manager also, so you can charge for shipping or at least re uh, reveal what that is. And then you can offer them more items. So they'll get the survey from you through Backerkit saying, asking for those questions, like for those things, like plug in this, plug in that, plug in this. Um, and then it's like another checkout experience where they can just go through it and not buy anything else. And it'll be $0 unless they're shipping. Uh, or they can add to their items. They can be like, you know what? I wanted two games. So I can click a button and get two games, or I can click another button and get that cool add-on or that early bird I missed out on. I can add that on for five extra bucks. Um, and then they kind of go through that process and they uh, they create their custom bundle of what they want, or maybe they just want to give you their address and that's it. That's another way backers work. Um, and then it's up to you to kind of initiate when you would charge those cards, but you're collecting all that information so you can work with your manufacturer and understand like, well, I'm, I sold 500 games on Kickstarter, but maybe I sold another 200 in backer kit. So you can kind of work with your manufacturing minimums and stuff like that and get it going. Um, but the, the short version is they're going to get a survey from you from backer kit. They're going to fill out that information. It's going to populate your dashboard and you're going to have a lot of control over that data and how you can message and interact with those folks. Um, and then they're going to just be alerted when it's time to charge the cards. And then they're going to be alerted again when it's like time to ship and stuff like that. Um, but it's, it's key to remember that it's separate from Kickstarter. It's a, it's a, it's a separate platform. Um, and I'm assuming your journey was uh, the backer journey. I'm not sure about the creator journey. If you want that, uh, you can put it in the comments and I'll, I'll give you a little bit more of a rundown. Um, that's kind of a two cent version. There's so many opportunities within the pledge manager you can like uh, there's like the power of segmenting your audience like if you want to give people in a certain region different opportunities or if you have different items and you want to add limitations to them you can do all kinds of stuff um, and get real creative with it uh, and don't forget uh, Backerkit also will provide you with a pre-order store so if people missed your campaign, they can go to your backer kit pre-order store and they can order the items at the same price or a discounted price or not, not discounted or like maybe slightly more MSRP or whatever. Um, and then all that information all feeds into the backer kit dashboard. So you can easily uh, manage all of your backers in one place uh, and then make sure you can deliver them uh, everything accurately on time and everything like that. Cause um, if people don't organize in that way, you can lose a lot of money off shipping. Uh, and whatnot. Um, these are great questions. I appreciate it. Um, I hope that answers that. It's kind of the two cent version, like I said. Um, but yeah, the, the whole point of the, the user journey, the backer journey with the pledge manager is to create a really smooth checkout experience. They, they're just going to get an email. They're going to fill out a few simple questions, add to their item, and then they're going to like hit OK. And then they can actually edit it later. If they, if they move, they can go in there and self uh, edit their address so they don't have to email you and bug you and blah, blah, blah. So you can just constantly, they can just revisit their um, surveys until you decide to charge and ship your items. So it's quite simple for the backer. It's it's really, really simple. Um, but for the creator, you can get really uh, into the, the back end and do some creative, unique things depending on your different, um, your different challenges or your different requests or things that you want to do. Um, that's good. Do the link in the chat. Which link? I'm not sure what you're talking about, but maybe it's backer kit. I can share that one. I'll just throw that in one more time. Sorry, I'm a little bit, we got a lot of good questions in here. So sometimes it gets buried. Okay, it's a little intimate right now, just over a thousand people. Uh, that's actually a really good number for your email list, uh, Jolly Swagman Games. Um, if that's considered intimate, I think you're gonna be just fine because a lot of people struggle to get even a hundred, but I think a hundred is super great as well. Um, so if I'm assuming you got those thousand people from, you know, your websites and messaging and they're, they're knowing it's directly for your product, your games, great job. Keep up the good work. I would love to see what happens if you plug that 1000 people into Backerkit launch, uh, which you can find through the link I just put down there um, and see what your percent is for like how many of those people have used crowdfunding before. Um, and remember, it doesn't mean it's like completely 
garbage if they haven't used crowdfunding before. It just means that they might need some further education into how it works. Cause you know, it's not Amazon. They're not gonna get their product the second they hit the button. There might be some like an email you'd wanna send out saying like new to Kickstarter, this is how it works, blah, 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 blah. And then they can kind of be informed and you can kind of teach them how crowdfunding works a little bit. All right, Mark is back. I know that email lists beforehand are a great way to get backers, but only 5% of people on an email list go on to back on average. Do you know the percent of people who back who have clicked the notify me button on Kickstarter? It's actually a really good question. I think it's pretty comparable from what I've researched and talked to actually staff at Kickstarter about. Um, I think it's pretty comparable. Uh, and you're you're not wrong. It sounds it might be shocking to some people, but you know, on the industry average for like conversions on a, on a newsletter is is I mean five percent would be great. That's even really pretty good. But I will say there's a caveat to that. If I'm running a project, let's say, and I just want to raise three thousand dollars to make a thing, your list might be more concentrated. Like we just ran, um, we actually have a project, uh, someone at Backerkit is running for a children's book and they got about 150 emails and their goal was 3,500. And they got, they got funded on day one because their email list converted really, really high because it was really, con it was friends and family and people they had seen in person and people they worked with. So that original like core of people can be really, really strong. Um, but you know, over time as that list grows and you get it through other outlets like websites and blog posts and going to events, that's that, that number gets probably a little bit smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, that's true, but don't let it deter you from launching a project. If your funding goals are maybe a little bit more, uh, achievable, if that makes sense. Um, I've seen people like, it all, it all depends on your product too. The very first product I ever put on Kickstarter was a zine. And it was just like kind of the topic was kind of in the news a little bit. I didn't have any, I didn't, I had zero people. I didn't even have an email list. I didn't email anybody, but we still got funded because there was like a, a wave we could ride because there was some popularity with it. And then uh, my second project, a board game, much more competitive. Uh, so I was like, man, there's like, 400 board games live at any given time on Kickstarter, I got to really start building my audience now around this board game. And I got about 500. Uh, and then I ended up getting funded. Uh, my goal was 10K. I made about 17K. Um, and my, I think it was about 18% or something of my email list ended up backing because it was hyper concentrated. It was mostly from Gen Con, Essence Spiel, uh, Pax U, people that like played my game, had hands-on experience. So what I'm trying to drive home is the the concentration of your email list is super, super important. Do your due diligence and make sure the right people are, are on it. And it's not a super casual ad. It's not just like, oh, I'll, I'll add this just because I'm whatever. Like make sure there's some kind of incentive for them or uh, it's just like really clear. But yeah, percentage for people who have clicked the notify me button, it's very comparable. And this brings up a good point. This isn't your question, but I think a lot of people would be tempted to drive people to the notify me button instead of your landing page with your email capture. Um, I would I would strategize a bit differently and I wouldn't think of it that way. Once you have your Kickstarter notify me button page, that does not that should not turn into your number one place to send new people. It should be a place to send your existing people. But I would think of it as get their email first and then email the people that you've already collected that notify me button. Uh, because if you do it the other way, again, you're not going to get any information from those people that click notify me. You're not going to get their email ever. Even if you get funded, you'll never get their email address. You'll never know who they are, what they're doing, what they ate for lunch, nothing like that. So be really mindful of your long game, not just your short game. It's really tempting to be like, oh, I'm going to have them go there because it's the platform and I want them to in interact with the platform only because that's where they're going to spend the money. But never underestimate the power of that email address because you can collect email, collect email, collect email. And then maybe every time someone new, like let's say you have a Kickstarter page. If somebody new joins your email list, once they sign up and confirm it, you can send them right to that Kickstarter page. Like immediately just have an automated, like, welcome to my community. Did you know we have a launch coming up? Be sure to click notify me on Kickstarter. That way you've already got them in your community. You've collected them. They're like your Pokemon cards. You've got them. Um, 
but then they also have an opportunity to be notified by Kickstarter because uh, then they're going to get a notification through your email and Kickstarter. It's okay. Uh, I think that's fine, but it's better than just Kickstarter and no control over. Um, you'll, you'll never have any control over that, uh, that list of folks, unfortunately, but they will get message. So there's like some benefit to it. Uh, thanks for these questions, Mark. These are really good. Um, Exceptional heroes. Our goal is 185k to go into manufacturing and production, mental health therapeutics companion. Very cool. 185k is super high, but you know, achievable if you've got your ducks in a row. So I'd be curious to know what research you've done to come to that 185k goal. Um, but you know, that's very real for a lot of these big things. That's why crowdfunding exists. Can't afford to, to make this stuff without it. Boom, boom. First features, can we test our new games on your Facebook site um, from first features on YouTube? I'm assuming you're asking about um, our Facebook group. There's no rules really in there other than don't spam it. But yeah, if you want, if you have specific questions or you want to link to something that you think uh, will help you on your journey to get to crowdfunding, I uh, I'm the moderator of the group. I'd be happy to take a look at it. Um, Everything in that group has to be approved by me before it like goes out into the wild anyway. So don't hesitate, just message me through there or just try and make the post and I'll look at it. And if it doesn't meet the standards, I'll just message you and we'll figure it out. But um, yeah, don't hesitate. If you got something to share, if you think it'll help you or other people with their crowdfunding journey, and it has to do with uh, tabletop games, it's very specifically about tabletop games, um, then it should be just fine. Uh, thanks for asking though. Here we go. How does Backerkit collect payment after the campaign is over? If charging shipping post campaign, that's a very good question. I think I saw you on the first live stream. Thanks for coming back. Um, this is from Facebook. So that's a great question. So like I mentioned before, Kickstarter is gonna do the initial charge and that's like done, signed, sealed, delivered. They, you've already had a transaction with your backers in that way, they're done. Now, a few a few things to note before we get into the, the, the second part of this question. Um, if you are deciding to charge for shipping after the campaign, which a lot of people do, uh, it's very smart. There's a lot of reasons to do it, uh, especially in this volatile kind of shipping world we live in right now. It's not as predictable. Um, what you wanna do as a creator is give your backers the best experience and the best deal. You don't wanna overcharge, you don't wanna undercharge. So. If you do charge later through backer kit, which is what I obviously I'm a backer kit, obviously I'm gonna um, suggest you do that. It's what I did for my last project. Um, you just have to make sure you're really clear about it in as many places as possible. I would say the key locations are within your reward tier itself, the description of your reward tier, like when it says base game, you get one copy of your game. I would put an asterisk or a bullet point under that saying charging will be shipped, uh, will be charged after the campaign. Uh, via backer kit or via whatever, or you can just say sh shipping will be charged after the campaign. And then you should have a dedicated shipping section on your campaign page that will maybe in a little bit more detail, talk about the shipping experience. And you can still put in guesstimates and stuff like that, um, but always put in the asterisk saying like, these are just estimates. We'll let you know closer to shipping, like what the final cost will be. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, once the campaign's over, they've done their transaction with Kickstarter, we're gonna send, you're gonna send a survey to your backers via backer kit, like I mentioned before. And that survey is where you're gonna collect shipping information, uh, address information, and give them an opportunity to buy more if they want to before they check out. So after the campaign is over, it's gonna be a second transaction. So they're gonna be charged again. So when they get their survey, it's going to read all the information from Kickstarter, what tier they're in, what they got, what they collected, and then it's going to kind of itemize it and show it to the backer and it's gonna say, you got all this and this is what you owe for shipping because you'll assign shipping. You assign all your items weights and by region, like what it'll cost. And then Backerkit does the smart math behind the scenes to figure out based on weight and location, um, how much it's gonna cost. So that survey is how they will actually be uh, charged one more time um, via Backerkit uh, to get the shipping. But the the kind of, this is just like insider kind of secrety stuff. Um, so exit through the gift shop. I'm a super backer. I back a lot of things. So if I have to pay for shipping anyway, my chances of adding a few things to my cart are much higher if my shipping is just even. If I get a survey and it's like, 
you don't owe anything. I'm just gonna be like, all right, I'm out. I'm just don't add anything else. Oh my gosh, even if I want to. Um, but if I gotta pay five bucks anyway, I'll probably throw in a pin or an expansion or something like that. So there's like a subliminal kind of like advantage to that. Um, but exit through the gift shop. It's a story as old as time and it works. So uh, make sure you give people the opportunity and it, that's exactly what it is. It's an opportunity and option. People don't have to do it, but statistically people, a lot of people do do it. So um, I would make sure to like kind of bake that into your strategy. Um, but yeah, so shipping will be charged post campaign, but be very clear about it on your campaign page. Uh, it is becoming very standard within Kickstarter to do that lately. So it's not as a shock to backers as it was say four years ago, five years ago. Now it's kind of standard practice because a lot of people are seeing the advantages of charging a more fair price later. That's a little bit closer. Um, but you know, if you get too wrapped up into shipping, there's always strategies you can do if it's not a lot. If you're doing US only and you live in the US, for example, and you know your shipping can maybe have a book and it can be media mail and you know it's gonna be about five bucks across the board no matter what you do, you can make your base pledge a little bit more expensive, say a $20 book into a $25 book, and then say plus free shipping. So it's kind of this like, you know, would you buy a book for $20 plus five shipping or a book for $25 in free shipping? Sometimes uh, that free shipping incentive will push people over the edge to, to, con to buy your product. But you have to have a really good hold and do your estimates about what your shipping costs are going to be because you don't want it to sneak up on you because shipping is one of the things that um, can nip you uh, if you're not careful. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Jolly's back. How far out from the campaign would you do pre-live ads? For example, if you're trying to just build community and awareness quite far out, would paid and targeting advertising be worth it? There's a few things to consider. Um, so I know some creators that do monthly newsletters and they send stuff out, maybe weekly newsletters or every other week. And they, they want to build their list because they have other content they want to share. Maybe it's blog posts. Maybe it's things they sell outside of Kickstarter, like an e-commerce store that they have or, you know, whatever. Um, so if you have, but if you're just building a list just for this Kickstarter and like, that's all you really kind of want to do. Like if you're not really nurturing that audience a lot and you're just kind of like, I, I built this list just to kind of let people know about this. There, there is maybe, maybe some rules, but I would say not 10 years out. I would say once you know that you're going to launch maybe within the next, I'm just gonna I'm gonna give you some like guesses, but these all come with a grain of salt. Like I would say six months out would be okay. That's fine. It might be a little far because the closer you get, the probably the higher chance you are of like converting somebody. Like if I sign up to get alerted about your new Kickstarter a week before it comes out, I'm it might be fresher in my mind, so I'll go and buy it. But you know. If you're nurturing that audience once a week and within your newsletter, you're like have a countdown clock for your launch or you have like messaging that's like behind the scenes look that all leads to this inevitable thing. You can totally work the hype on it and be like, if you know, you're going to be consistently like messaging these people about your launch, you can do it much early, much later or earlier, uh, depending. Um, so, yeah, I would say like six months would be fine. Um, but, you know two to three months, maybe two, one to two months is probably, if you're going just for that like straight conversion, just straight like get into the page and sell it, that might be smart. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of factors to consider there. Like how much have you messaged them in the past? How consistent do you message them? Who's in this audience? There's, there's a lot of factors. So I, I can't give you a super clean answer, unfortunately. Um, but when it comes to building your community and collecting emails and running ads to collect emails, I, I just, I never think it's too soon. I think I wish more people just started doing it right now. Like no matter what, like I actually started building my email list for my game a year before I even launched the game. And a lot of those people ended up like buying the game and converting anyway. And they, that was like a year ago because those people liked hearing the journey and, and getting and building up that hype. And finally it's happening. So I'm going to support you. Um, so there's pros and cons to both. Um, but yeah, and it, it depends on your budget, like how much you have and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, sorry, I don't have like a super clean answer for that, but that's, um, yeah, let's see here. we got a new one. Leonardo, can we list check if we only have 400 emails? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I assume you're talking about backer kit launch to see like kind of the quality of your email list. If they've used crowdfunding, you can throw in however many emails you want, 400 totally. 
Um, and that's for free. Uh, so just to clarify, Backer Kit Launch is a service that you can use. It's $99 per project if you want to use it. And Backer Kit Launch is like a series of templates uh, and advice on consistency for like when to message your community. So you'll send them emails uh, before you launch, the day you launch, a little bit into your launch, when your project's about over. Backer Kit Launch is just a really powerful way that has like baked in best practices from 10,000 creators of like, when should you send messages? How should you word them? How long should they be? What kind of images should you use? It's just a really like, based on all of our experience with all of our customers, this is like how you leverage your email list. But for free, you can plug in your information to Backer Kit Launch and get that percent number and kind of like get a sense of it. Um, that's totally free because we want people to kind of get that insight without having to pay any money. Um, but I will tell you that $99 per project is like super cheap in my experience. I used it and most of my backers came through my backer kit launch emails. Uh, think of it as MailChimp for crowdfunding. Uh, it doesn't replace your newsletter service. It's not something you're going to send people once a month for years. It's kind of that unique window around your crowdfunding campaign. You want people to get hyped and properly informed about like what's going on. And Backer Get Launch is really a great way to organize that. Uh, it doesn't build your list for you. It just harnesses the power of your existing list that you have. Once you once you put all that work into it, we notice people, they'll build their email list for two years. And then once they launch, they don't really do it the right way. They don't send the right kind of messages where they spam people and it's too much or too little. Um, so we're really just trying to let people know, like, these are the best practices in, that we've seen industry wide that you should follow. So you can get the most out of the, the hard work that you've done to build this list because it's not easy. Here we go. Brittany Chapman, any tips for crowdfunding for films? Do it. Films are great. I love films. Um, I will say I don't have a time. So I'm working on something that might turn into a film project on Kickstarter. I think this is going to be more about expectation setting uh, because films generally don't do like super well on, on these platforms. I'm not saying that they they're not worth doing. I'm just saying that they're not like like tabletop games make so much money and it's just like a jamming community right now. Films is a little smaller. Something I know um, a lot of people do is like proof of concept videos on Kickstarter. So if you know you wanna make a, fil a short film or a feature film, but it might just cost way too much to like go from beginning to fruition, I would consider like um, more of a proof of concept version of that. Like maybe a one minute segment or a five minute segment. I've backed a few projects that were just for proof of concept because they looked really cool. They were like all 80s inspired. And I'm like, I would love to see this. It's almost like two steps. It's like get the proof of concept out there and then get the movie out there. But sometimes film, uh, if you're a filmmaker, I went to film school, so I think you understand a lot of times it's a process. It can take years to get to where you want to be uh, with film. So I totally have empathy for you there. Um, but the best, the best advice I can give, if you are serious about crowdfunding, eventually start building your community right now. Don't wait for anything. If you know the theme of your movie, if you kind of have some background information or behind the curtain scene uh, that you can like share with people or process you can share with people or Q and A's you can provide people, start building your email list immediately because it might be a little uphill to get organic off Kickstarter. Um, it's really gonna be about who you bring to this Kickstarter page. Uh, so start today. Uh, the, if you haven't yet, just, Sign up for MailChimp. It's free at first until you have 2,000 uh, folks in there. Um, get a Squarespace account or some, some website if you don't already and create a landing page that's starting to build hype for a potential film and start just giving people some nuggets uh, and information that you can kind of build community around and start looking at other projects, uh, start researching other projects. Um, something a lot of people don't give enough credit to is kickstarter.com is actually your number one resource because you can see all of these projects that have succeeded and failed, whether they made it or not, they're all archived on there. So you can look, what did they do? Like, look at other projects. How, how much did they raise? What kind of messaging did they do? What did their updates look like? Um, just start studying other projects that are like similar to your film. And I think that would be a really good place to start because um film is a very broad topic you know it could be an animation it could be stop animation it could be action adventure uh, documentary there's so many avenues you can go for so um start researching like-minded projects just on kickstarter.com just 
go to their filters and start looking at films and you can filter by like most backed projects. Um, I always encourage people to filter by most backed, not most funded, because uh, I'm more interested in how many people came to the party, not how much did it cost to get into the party. Uh, I want to know how many people actually like showed up and cared enough to like open up their wallet for something. That's more interesting to me. Um, yeah. I hope that answers your question, Brittany. Uh, you can feel free to email me as well, either community at backforkit.com or jason at backforkit.com. And we can talk shop about films because I love talking about films. Um, Leonardo, can you describe exactly the user journey when using the pledge manager? Is it only the end of the campaign? How do you how do you direct the users to blah, blah, blah? So I think I answered most of this question already, um, but to answer another part, is it only at the end of the campaign? So the pledge manager, yes. Uh, the pledge manager software is only for people that have already successfully funded a project uh, on the crowdfunding platform, Kickstarter, Indiegogo. Um, then you'll get access to the pledge manager, which is where you can like uh, organize the backers and the data and all that stuff. Um, so it, that that is at the once the campaign is concluded. Um, how do you direct users to that? So the creator gets it through Backerkit. Obviously, you you get assigned. You know, you, you you'll get uh, taken care of from Backerkit as the creator, and then the backers will get that survey I mentioned earlier in the broadcast uh, to interact with the pledge manager. That's their way to interact with the pledge manager is the survey. Um, so that I hope that answers your question. I, I think I answered most of that already. So I'm going to move on since we got a lot of questions down here. Those are great questions, by the way. I appreciate these. Uh, Ooh la la Holly back. I want to do crowdfunding on my own website. I was going to do it on Kickstarter, but I don't think there's anything they can do for me that I can't do for myself. The product is women's jeans. Well, it all depends on how scrappy you are and how much you can like, you know, build, you know, some, you know, if, if you think you can do this through PayPal or something like that, uh, I think you're right about Kickstarter not doing a lot for you in the sense of building traffic. Like it's not a place that's going to generate backers for you. Uh, that's all about your email list and and, and you and your efforts. Um, my analogy that I can never avoid in Q and A's is uh, Kickstarter, Indiegogo are the venues, and it's up to you to bring the party. So I wouldn't underestimate how awesome the venue is though, because Kickstarter thinks of a lot of the stuff for you, a lot of the legality stuff, a lot of the messaging, a lot of the community stuff, just the organization. And it's got all these baked in things like with the reward tiers and the about sections and the all that stuff, it's all kind of like thought of and it's been refined over the years. So it's actually a really good experience for the backers to go through that way. And it's very shareable. There's a lot of community opportunity within the platform. Uh, and then when it comes to cashing out and getting the fees, it makes it a lot cleaner for tax season, stuff like that. Um, so I wouldn't underestimate the value of it strictly as just the platform, like just a place for you to focus on your product. Because at the end of the day, you want most of your attention to be with your community and with your product. I, not like the nitty gritty of like managing the, the actual uh, project on your own. But, you know, I'm not sure what your background is or how savvy you are on, you know, maybe you can build something. And if you do, I would love to see it because that would be interesting. There are a few other platforms out there that are trying to compete with Kickstarter. Um, some of them category specific, some of them not. Um, but over 10 years, none of them have seemed to overpass the, the power of Kickstarter. Um, so uh, yeah, I would I'd definitely be curious to see, I'm not saying it can't happen, but I would like to see what it would look like. Um, and I'm looking forward, like that sounds good, women's jeans. We have someone at Backerkit doing some uh, undergarment campaign soon. So maybe there's some maybe talk shop about that too, because I'm learning a lot about like the apparel and clothes market as well and how that works. Um, it's an interesting category. Um, so yeah. Da -da -da. Christian Morris, any tips for how to avoid canceled pledges on Kickstarter? I didn't have any for two weeks in my campaign and then have started having lots since. Um, my main tip is it's going to happen. It happens to everybody. Every single person in the history of history gets people canceling their projects. Uh, a lot of people impulse buy stuff. A lot of people come and go. So there is a lot of, um, you know, 
it's, it's just one of those things. It's like when you get to unsubscribe from your newsletter, it just happens. It's part of the game. Every time you send messages, you get people leaving. You're like, I don't want that. Um, but my tips for avoiding cancel pledges is like, it's probably not going to happen. It's just going to happen. I mean, you can't avoid it. It's, it's, it's inevitable. But what I would say is have an intriguing low tier reward tier, like a dollar tier, and just have that as kind of like a way to keep somebody's attention, but maybe they're not spending a lot of money. If it's just like, want to just, um, you know, want to just keep track of our progress and get access to the pledge manager later, uh, just give us a dollar for now. It's okay to get like a dollar pledge from somebody early, like now, and then maybe upsell them later. And you can do that through Backerkit through the survey. Like once the project's done and complete and funded, um, you can send them your survey and ask them like if they only pledge for a dollar on Kickstarter, they can pledge for the base game through Backerkit and you can recollect that person. Because um, to me, you're going to make the most money out of people that have pledged already, not new people once your campaign's over. And to me, these people that don't pledge or just pledge a dollar are kind of like super important because they're your like next line of uh, like how you're gonna, who you're going to sell to the ne uh, next. Um, so yeah, didn't have any for two weeks, then my campaign, um, you know, just keep positive in your messages and your updates to your project. Um, don't really acknowledge it publicly. Just It's just part of the game. It just happens. So I would just keep a cool head about it. it it's a bummer, but it, it told, I could show you charts from my two Kickstarters. I lost people all, you know, all the time. It, it just happened. People will pledge and then they'll see another project they want and pledge, or maybe if they think it won't get funded, they'll take it away. It just happens. So um, yeah, I would just kind of take it in stride. Um, Mark? A compliment from Mark. Love your answer. It's really grateful. Thank you. My game is Bounty Hunters, the game, .co .uk. Check it out, folks. Um, my first ever board game. Hopefully the first of many in a new career. I hope so as well. Um, so yeah, check that out, folks. Screen grab. Give everyone a minute to screen grab that. Uh, actually, I'm going to do it because I want to check it out later, too. feel like I know you. Um, here we go. Olaf's, hey, what are your thoughts on a number of rewards? First campaign failed. Uh, I'm going to challenge that. You were unfunded. You did not fail. You learned a lot. And Yoda teaches us that the best teacher is failure or learning a lot. <laughs> so you have just you just went through crowdfunding college by going through a project that didn't get funded. So uh, congr congratulations, actually. That's a big achievement. Um, all right. What are your thoughts on the number of rewards? First, we had a you know, campaign around 10 of them to spread prices evenly. Now I have thoughts about only doing five-ish with bigger gaps. So my main advice for reward tiers is to keep it simple, uh, especially if you're a first-time creator, you have to understand the, uh, and it's a, it's a video game for people that are wondering, uh, that was later in the comments. You have to understand that a lot of people might not be familiar with Kickstarter or crowdfunding or Indiegogo, wherever you're at, they just might not be familiar with it. So you want to make their experience as simple as possible as well. The more reward tiers you have, the more options you give people in that, it can be um, it can be paralyzing. People could be like, whoa, this is too much. I can't, I can't even decide. I'm gonna come back to it. And then they never do. So, you know, five or less is what I always recommend for people. Have a dollar tier, like I mentioned, something like an easy gateway of entry. I know there's a like put whatever you want tier in Kickstarter, for example. But if you just explicitly write out a dollar tier and give them a reason like to join our pledge manager, to get you to get uh, private updates or something like that, have that really entry level reward tier, no matter what you do. Secondly, it should be your base tier. Thirdly, make like a deluxe version of your base tier. Like if it's a board game, an expansion. If it's a video game, something a little extra. And then have like some big Kickstarter deluxe thing that maybe costs more than you think you should sell anything for. Because you'll be surprised how many people go for those bigger tiers. For my board game, I had a dollar, um, $34, I forget. It was like a dollar, 30 something dollars, 40 something dollars. Um, and then 49 was like one. I was like, nobody's gonna buy. 50 bucks for this thing because in my mind it's only worth 30 but my number one reward tier was the 50 dollars tier but the key there was to make it super simple it's kind of like a ladder like the dollars like oh yeah maybe and then just a little bit more 25 ish and then 35 -ish. like make the increments a little bit small um but yeah you said you're only doing like five ish with bigger bigger gaps maybe um but uh, yeah i don't know i hope this helps i know it's kind of keep it simple make it clear 
don't overthink it, uh, especially if you're going to use a pledge manager later. We can do all that complicated custom bundle stuff later. When you send your survey, then you can be like, do you want two of these? Do you want three of these? People will be tempted to put all these different options in the reward tiers. Just sell your base game, a deluxe version of the game, and something else, and then let people know once the campaign's over, they'll have an opportunity to buy more. Um, but they don't have to do it like right then and there, um, unless it's something that you think will stack. If it's a video game, I'm assuming you probably don't need to be like two copies of the video game. Like you don't have to do any reward tiers like that. Um, but yeah, keep it simple, keep it focused. Don't add things that aren't really about the main the main thing. Um, I don't have a great answer for this one. First features, I apologize. Uh, we completed a campaign with Indiegogo. We sent the perks to our contributors, but never received the money from Indiegogo. I complained, but no response. What would you suggest doing moving forward? I'm not 100% sure. I would try and find the best way to reach out to Indiegogo. Obviously, I can't help you with that. Um, and if they're not being responsive, I'm not sure what the process is uh, for going down there. But uh, I'd have to look at your project and see um what what the deal is there um because yeah that seems um funky so yeah i have to learn more before i can better answer that um yeah and then maybe create add-ons instead of extra rewards is a better idea so kickstarter recently did do the add-ons feature uh which is something that when like let's say i have a base product and i say yeah i want to back this for 25 bucks then an option comes up saying do you want to add anything else on and then there's other things people can add on um, there's a benefit to that and not a benefit. The benefit is any add-ons that people will add on in that process will go towards your funding goal so you can get closer to your goal quicker. Um, but some negatives to that are it will it, that could potentially overcomplicate things for newcomers. Like if I'm newer to the scene and like I, I've, I've heard of people buying the thing and then buying a second copy of the thing thinking it, they were only getting one and then it made the money go all over the place. Um, and then also remember, Kickstarter will take a percentage fee um, from your campaign. So uh, they will also take it out of any add-ons. So if you wanted to sell stuff later, um, BackerKit has a, uh, a feature, an add-ons feature. We've had it for like nearly a decade that you can do through the surveys. Uh, adding custom bundles that I keep talking about is basically an add-on. Um, we take a little bit less of a percentage uh, percent off that. Like uh, I think they take 5%, we take 3.5%. So you can save a little bit of money if it adds up uh, doing it that way. But you know, worth considering. It is a new tool in there. It can work for you, um, and and I, you know, I do recommend people do add-ons one way or another, uh, whether it's through Kickstarter or through a pledge manager. Um, yeah. Okay. We don't have a ton more questions, so I'm going to try and blow through some of these because um, we're a little over time. But I'm I'm happy to stick on for uh, twenty or so more minutes because the jamming. You guys are asking some really good questions. Um, do back do packer get email surveys typically go to inbox or do you have any issue with them going to a junk folder? I mean, it happens from time to time, but I will say we've been doing this for years and years and years, and we have a dedicated team that uh, definitely looks into spam filters and junk folders and stuff like that, and they're very uh, competent at what they do. So we don't have a lot of issues. We're sending out. I mean, we've oh my goodness. Let me see. I'm gonna look something up really quick. Get a. I'm gonna get a fast fact for you. Um, so. In a nutshell, we've surveyed, we've sent surveys to 16.2 million backers since we've been a company. Um, and it hasn't been an issue with to, to any severe degree with 16.2 um, million surveys. Uh, if that ever happens for some reason, offshoot chance, uh, you can have a backer uh, account, a backer kit account. Uh, where you can access all of your surveys. So worst case scenario, if somebody's not getting their thing and they message and they say, hey, I never got the survey, you can send them a link that will send them directly to the survey. So you can fix it really quick if it does happen. But uh, in my experience, I've been here for about four years. It has not been an, an issue. So I think you'll be just fine. Um, I see a repeat question in there. <laughs> Thanks for the previous questions. If we if we can have tax and shipping paid on backer kit after the campaign, what happens if a backer doesn't complete that survey? Um, well, that's they need to complete the survey before you'll send them their stuff. So if they want their stuff, they're going to have to go through that survey process. And that's for anything. Kickstarter, if you do surveys through Kickstarter or through backer kit or through anywhere, they got to go through that survey process. So 
Uh, but you have a unique way to identify who's not filling it out and you can message them separately and say like, hey, we can't ship you your thing until these payments are, are done. Um, especially if you were clear about tax and shipping and prices like that uh, on your campaign page. Um, if it's It all needs to be really clear to the backer before they even pledge to your project. So assuming you've done all of your due diligence there, uh, you'll have ways to segment those folks and message those folks so you can get it to the finish line. Um, but, you know, I, I've run two successful campaigns and both of them still have more people than I would like never filled out the survey and I never sent them the thing. And they're seemingly just disappeared like uh, like the Infinity Gauntlet. Someone snapped and they all just disappeared. So I'm like, I don't know why they don't want like some of these people spent 50 bucks on something and they never filled out the survey and they never messaged me. And I even reached out and said, like, what's up and never heard anything. So it happens. Um, so I have no idea. Um, Ooh, the Facebook. Okay, there's a question. Sorry, I'm getting through comments. Thanks for the comments too. Here's exceptional heroes. Does Banker get have reps to speak with over the phone or Zoom so I can ensure I'm doing the right step for a successful Kickstarter? I mean, we don't have like a customer service hotline. We're a pretty small company comparatively speaking to other companies. Um, so unfortunately, we can't just like get on the horn. Um, but if you have specific questions, you're in the right place. You can ask in these. I'm trying to do these weekly. Uh, or you can email. Uh, I can't like hold hands throughout entire processes, but I can point you in the right direction and show you the right help docs. Um, if you just wanted to uh, shoot me a line at community at backerkit.com. If you have specific hurdles or things blocking you from completing your process, we can help you out. Um, so yeah, don't, don't hesitate to reach out there. This is not like a customer support email. This is just me. Um, but we do have, I, I can link you with help docs and stuff like that, if that will help you. Um, cause we do have a pretty, uh, pretty, pretty good, um, help doc section on Backerkit for, for just this reason. All right. So these questions, these are really good questions. Here we go, Mark. I'm really taking the board on board this advice. Yes. The long game versus short term is hitting home. Was I just saying people directly on Kickstarter? What happens to the product? Doesn't fund. Um, ba, ba, ba. So, yeah, the answer I, I'm not going to read this one all out loud, but can you give prices for Backerkit survey service? So, that would be the pledge manager service. So, at backerkit.com. You can just go to our pricing page and then you can type in um, some information. It'll tell you uh, we have a we have like a pricing page. It's different for people for different uh, projects. So um, I can't give you a definite answer there, but you can I'm sure you can find what you need just through backgrid.com and our pricing page. Um, what happens if a product doesn't fund? Do we still pay for the service? Um, so for for Kickstarter, uh, if it doesn't fund, it's like all or nothing and you don't really pay anything. And it's just zero to zero zero. Um, but with backer kit, um, you're typically using the pledge manager once you're already funded or on your way to funded. So people aren't typically paying for it. Um, I'm going to take this comment off because I'm hiding behind it um, until until you're funded. So uh, once it's predictable and you know you're going to get funded, then you would purchase uh, that. But people have been known to sign up early and pay early. Um, but yeah, that's a case by case basis there. Um, but yeah, I would say. As far as pledge manager goes, uh, first see, uh, you know, get your campaign going and then uh, and then you can sign up for it. Like if you're mid campaign and you think and you know you're going to get funded, then you can uh, sign up for backer kit uh, pledge, pledge manager. And then the backer get launch is just like a flat $100 fee, whether you get funded or not. It's just like to use it because um, you do get a lot of insights and data from that. So you, you will get a lot of value out of it, no matter if you get funded or not. Um, yeah. So I hope that answers your question. And that's another question. Here's one. I reached out to Backerkit to inquire about using its service, assuming the ad service, but was told there's a process to first check if the project is a good fit. What qualifies a project to be a good fit? So I don't have the checklist with me right now. I am. I am working on a webinar as we speak outside of these. It's going to be on Crowdcast that is going to specifically talk about um, marketing ads 101 and what you need to do to set yourself up for success and what it does take to like qualify to use the service. Um, so be sure to connect with us. I'm going to drop the link for our newsletter one more time. 
If you haven't joined the newsletter yet, uh, I'll also put it down here. Join this newsletter because um, that's where you're going to get the alerts for our upcoming webinar content um, and exact dates and guests and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I think just to be privy on that. Um, sorry, I lost my spot in my Q&A. Let me pull that question back up. Um, there we go. So yeah, so I don't have the like definitive checklist with me right now, but I'm hoping to be more equipped with that soon. So like I, I mentioned, just stay tuned. It's probably going to be sometime in September. So be on the lookout for that and they'll answer all your questions. But on bankerkit.com, you can also fill out a form that's just like, this is where I'm at. And then they can assess it uh, and see if it's a good fit or not. Um, yeah, we got time for a few more. Quentin's got a question from YouTube. What advice? Um, what advice do you have to build an email list? How can I get the mail of a Facebook group, for instance? My project is linked to Dungeons and Dragons, but only for French people. So when it comes to building an email list, we could talk for hours about like how to build it. I'd say your North Star, what your main focus should be on is your, your project. So your Dungeons and Dragons, only for French people. So obviously should only be targeting French people. And if you're running ads, make sure your parameters and stuff like that are all towards the right audiences and the right people. Um, but as far as building it, attending events, digital events, physical events, um, having a blog and doing content marketing, like creating like sneak peeks and stuff like that, having your landing page uh, linked to all your social medias, making a group on Facebook or uh, any platform, whether it's uh, Discord or YouTube or Facebook, start building a community in ways that you like to do it. Um, but identify which social media platforms you personally enjoy working on and double down on those. You don't have to spread yourself thin and adopt every method possible. But like when you wake up, what do you like to do? Like, do you like to go on Facebook? Do you like to go on Discord? Do you like to go in a weird chat room that nobody knows about? Um, just double down on those efforts and try and pull people in. But again, I mentioned this earlier, it's not just about spamming and asking for stuff. It's about embedding yourself in the community, whether you're creating that community yourself or joining another person's community, try and give it value, give more than you take, and just kind of um, let it be known what you're working on, ask questions about what you're working on, um, get advice from other people, but uh, don't just ask for like people to join your list because that's really not how this like, you know, if you go into a grocery store and everyone's like, eat my bread, eat my bread. Like you're just like, I'm, I'm going to go pick out my own bread. Thank you very much. Um, I would just be mindful of the customer experience. Like is what you're providing them, are, are they giving it back? Like, you know, make it, make it like a more, it's a relationship, you know, you're building a community. You've got to meet people in the middle. Um, but I'm excited to hear about the project, but I'm not excited because uh, I don't speak French. So I, I'm, I'm going to have to miss out. Uh, it might take me a while to catch up, but uh, I, I would love to learn more about that. Um, but yeah, keep it focused on your project. Um, and then how do I get the mail of a Facebook group for instance? Unfortunately, you're not getting email when people join your Facebook group. You just have to straight up point them to your landing page. So if you have a landing page that collects emails, you would just share that link in your Facebook group, for example. Um, and that's how you'll get their emails. Mark is back. Mark, you now owe me $12. Sorry. Uh, I take PayPal, so you're gonna have to PayPal me that. Uh, joking, but how likely is it a project to be put on Kickstarter's projects we love? Maybe it's unrealistic to think mine would be picked out of the 400 tabletop games, but I am still going to get the organic Kickstarter backers without this feature. Um, yeah, you will. It's not gonna make or break your project. I think it's nice to have a projects we love badge, but um, if you have it and you don't have, my first project didn't have it. My second project did have it but I made twice as much on my first project. So it doesn't matter. It, it actually, uh, I don't wanna say it's meaningless, but it's close, close to meaningless. I would love to get it. It's a nice little stamp of approval from Kickstarter, but it's not, there's no magical like thing that's gonna really throw you to the moon. It might, pl it, like, it might place you in some algorithms or some like, uh, you know, I know you can search by projects we love, but I can tell you nearly a decade of, backing things on Kickstarter, I've never used the search. To, I, I don't search for projects based on projects that Kickstarter loves. Um, I gotta love it, you know? You know? <laughs> uh, so don't get hung up on it. I think um, 
as far as it's likely, I, can, I couldn't give you a number. I think if your project page is very clear and clean and you have good images and you do and you bake in all the best practices, your chances of getting that stamp are much higher. Um, but I will say that uh, don't let it stop. Like if you don't get it, it doesn't mean your project's bad or they don't like it. It just means they didn't happen to see it right when you wanted them to see it. Like your, your project's still probably super rad. So uh, don't worry about it. Just keep moving. If it shows up, just celebrate. Um, it's like a celebrity coming to a cool birthday. Like the birthday's already fun, but if a celebrity shows up, whoa, pretty cool. Um, but still a fun birthday party, so don't worry about it. Someone in the spirit of sharing, here we go. Screen grab moment. Let me screen grab it, Joe. There we go. Uh-uh. There we go. Kaiju Tempest. Now that's a cool name. Everybody likes seeing Starro in the Suicide Squad. Kaiju in a superhero movie. Digging it. Um Online ads, what type of cost per clip, cost per acquisitions, et cetera, is considered good? This is a very complicated question. I'm not the expert on ads per se, but I can say I've used these services that did it. Um, I do wanna have like a community statement here about, about this, because it's something I've been thinking about a lot. So if this is your first project, or maybe you've done a few projects, like spend time thinking about your expectations and your goals and what you wanna get out of this project. Um, because a lot of people get disappointed because they think ads are just going to be millions and millions of dollars and they're always like disappointed. So when we're talking about things like cost per click, cost per acquisition, return on your ad spend, for example, uh, it can get very complicated and it's very specific per person. I can give you an example of myself. So if I'm running ads, I, I would like a one to one ratio and this is really low. My expectations are really low. That means that for every dollar I put in, I would like to get a dollar back because accompanying that dollar is a backer or a person or a human or somebody to join my community. So I'm technically paying like this money to build interest and then bring people back. Now, obviously you wanna make money and you wanna have a profit margin. So like one to two, one to three, one to four, better and better and better. It's all better. But my expectation is very low because at the end of the day, if I were to tell you, like let's say I, let's say I spent $500 on ads and I got $500 back. I broke even, but I got 100 emails on my email list. If I were to say, hey, I have 100 people that would love to be on your email list and they're free, would you take them? Yes, absolutely. And that's basically what happened. It's just, it just took a while. <laughs> it just took a process to get to that point. But there's no, there's no way I would say no to that. So for me, with my low expectations, because I'm a new, like a newer crowdfunding creator, um, I would be happy to just break even and collect those emails and put them on my email list and have those backers. Um, or, you know, if you're running ads for your campaign, you're getting those people to purchase some something, so you have like the money, um, obviously. But then you can like, you know, in the back get survey, ask them to join your email list, so you can potentially uh, bring in people that way. So. Uh, I'm not going to get super messy and start giving you exact numbers. We have other people on the team that can answer that much better. So look out for that email or not email, that webinar I was talking about. Uh, I'm going to bring on some key people from Backerkit to give us some of that advice. Um, best way to get that again is through our newsletter. Um, also, thanks for the help. You're very welcome. Thanks for being here. Thanks for showing up. This could have been zero people, but it's a lot of people. So I appreciate it. Um, I just got connected with Luna. They are amazing. They are sending links and resources. You guys are awesome. I agree with everything in that statement. Great job. Good job, Luna. Um, they are awesome. This is correct. Um, I'm going to show this since it's there and I've been talking about it a lot. So I'll throw it back in there. PayPal sent. Oh, nice. Got the PayPal. Thanks, Mark. Worth every penny. I meant $1,400. See, that's what I meant. There was a glitch, bandwidth error. Uh, okay, we've got. Do, do, do one last question. This is it. This is the final question. Can your landing page be your website with the subscribe pop up to collect emails, or do I have to shut down my website and create a landing page? Very good question. Uh, no, your landing page could totally just be your website with a pop up. Uh, I do that myself. Um, so let me see. One, two, three. Da, 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 da. Oops, that's not right. Come. So if you go here, it's just jasonfury.com, you will see there's a pop-up. Uh, I do have a dedicated 
um, newsletter page that you can go to, but um, it's totally fine. You don't have to reinvent the wheel and create something brand new. Your, your landing page can totally be the pop-up. I would recommend, like on the site that I shared with you, my site, um, I would recommend having a dedicated newsletter page. The, the, so if you like, I'm using Squarespace, for example, the benefit of having a dedicated newsletter page is you can send people there uh, through like links and social media, and you can drop links in, in Discord, stuff like that, and have it very like specifically for that purpose. You can also archive. Um, I'm doing a really bad job on mine of archiving every newsletter I've sent out, but you can actually have an archive of um, newsletters uh, th on that page. Uh, and it can be just really simple stuff. You don't have to like overthink it or anything like that. Um, but a good start is the pop-up. I do know a lot of people that have done that, but I would recommend also having a um, dedicated newsletter page. But yeah, by no by no means uh, should you shut down your website and start over and do do it do it all over again. Because uh, if you have a website with content on it and it's already for your thing, that's great. Uh, that's totally good. And also look into your options. I'm not sure what service you're using, but you can put in the uh, footer. Uh, a subscription block so you can like have people sign up. So if they read a blog post at the bottom, it'll be down there or the sidebar or stuff or just a banner up top. Find creative ways to uh, have that throughout your website. Um, but yeah, it's very cool. Appreciate that question. Uh, and with that, we went a little bit over time, but I'm happy to do that because these questions were super excellent. So just 20 minutes over, totally worth my time, I think. Um, I appreciate everybody coming to this. Uh, this is very experimental. This is the only, the second time we've done a live Q&A like this, just to, anything goes, but everybody's been very respectful and asking very excellent questions. And uh, just, I just wanna take a minute to say, thank you so much for participating uh, and keep out, uh, you know, keep an eye out for the, the content that we've got coming out. And last but not least, something I've said a few times, if you're joining us later, I'm gonna put it in the comments. Um, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a Google form link. So it's a weird link. Um, but uh, if you haven't gone here yet, you can screen grab this. If you don't have the link show up where you're watching, uh, it's a nightmare to type in, but if you do it, just think of it like a game or something. Uh, if you do it, good job. Um, but fill out this form. It's something I'm gonna sift through and look at. Uh, and you have an opportunity to say like, if you wanna be put on the newsletter, I can just auto add you as well if you opt into it that way. Um, but this will give me an idea of like where you're coming from and what projects you've got going on. Um, and then you can, when you re if you reach out to me on email or the next live stream, I can have a little bit better sense of like what we're talking about so I can help you better. Um, but yeah, uh, that said, appreciate everybody's attention and everybody's participation again and be on the lookout for the next one. I'm gonna do this again, same time next week. Um, I can only schedule them a week in advance, so that's not gonna be made up till uh, later today. Um, but yeah, until next time, I hope this helps everybody on your path to crowdfunding success. I wanna see all these projects that I've read about come to fruition sometime soon. Uh, but yeah, until then, keep checking out backerkit.com and I will see you next time.